Hey, sixth graders, Mr. Drain here. Listen, uh, we are behind by about one lesson, and that's entirely my fault. We are going to catch up eventually. Um, one of the things we're going to do today to catch up is kind of combine two chapters into one presentation. So some of what I'm going to do today, I'm not going to read aloud to you as much as I normally would. We're just going to go over some of the answers to the worksheets that I'll have you work on. And that's because these next four chapters are um, covering one main series of events called the Exodus in the life of Israel. So today we are going to talk about um, the slavery in Egypt, Moses, and the revelation of God's name to Moses. And then um, for the very next lesson, we're going to talk about the Passover and the giving of the Ten Commandments. And all four of those things together constitute kind of the book of Exodus. So um, make sure you have your scriptures with you and your workbook. We're going to try to get through about two chapters today and get caught up. Let's begin with a prayer. <clears throat> In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Praise be to God the Father. Praise be to God the Son. Praise be to God the Holy Spirit. Praise be to God yesterday. Praise be to God today. Praise be to God tomorrow. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. So the Exodus is the central event of the Old Testament. And to understand the Exodus, we need to first understand slavery, right? What happens when someone's a slave? When a person is controlled by someone or something else, and sometimes referred to as a master, and they're therefore not free to do what he or she wants to do, that typically is what we would call slavery. Slavery violates the moral law, right? And what might you know about American slavery? The key points about American slavery are that African people were captured, chained, and brought to America on ships. They were sold to masters, primarily in the South, and many worked on plantations picking cotton, which is very hard work, as well as other difficult tasks. The slaves could not leave, and a slave's husband, wife, parents, or children could be sold to another master and never be seen by his or her family again. Slaves were often mistreated, brutally beaten, starved, and abused. They were considered property and not people. Slaves were freed in the United States in 1865 through the 13th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, which outlawed slavery. So slavery existed in the United States until this time, only a little over 150 years ago. And in fact, slavery has existed in many societies throughout history, including Sumer in Mesopotamia, in ancient Greece, ancient Rome, ancient China, ancient India, Arabia, Europe, and others. Though it is illegal, slavery and human trafficking continue in many places today. So today we're going to begin to learn about Exodus, when the Israelites escaped slavery in Egypt. So um, let's read, <clears throat> make sure I'm at the right place. Let's first turn in our workbooks to page 139 page 139, titled Slaves in Egypt, and read through this page and answer the questions. So take some time now and read through 139 and 138, and then I'm going to go over the questions before continuing on in the lesson. So take some time and do this Slaves in Egypt worksheet first. Number one, this is on page 140. What do we learn about the descendants of Jacob in the beginning of the book of Exodus? We learned that they had multiplied greatly after settling in the best land of Egypt, the land of Goshen or Goshen. How many people entered Egypt and how many people left Egypt at the Exodus? 70 or 75, 75 entered Egypt. So that's as many as, as made it to this uh, best land in Egypt, while nearly 2 million left at the Exodus nearly 400 years later. What does the Bible tell us about the new Pharaoh's relationship with Joseph and his descendants? What does this likely mean? It says that he did not know them. This likely meant that the new Pharaoh chose not to uphold any agreements that previous Pharaohs had made with the Israelites. Okay, he chose not to honor previous agreements. 
Why did the new Pharaoh fear the Israelites? Well, there were so many of them, he feared that they could overthrow his rule, and rightly so. So what did the Pharaoh force the Israelites to do? Number five, how were they treated? He forced them into slavery, in which they did hard labor and worked in the fields. They were treated cruelly and were hated. The Israelites continued to grow in number. What drastic action did the Pharaoh take to reduce their numbers? Infamously, he ordered any male born to an Israelite woman be killed. Now, Exodus chapter 3, verses 7 to 8 says, But the Lord said, I have witnessed the affliction of my people in Egypt and have heard their cry against their taskmasters. So I know well what they are suffering. Therefore, I have come down to rescue them from the power of the Egyptians. God spoke these words to a man named Moses. God had seen the affliction of his people in Egypt and heard their cry against their taskmasters. He called Moses to free his people from slavery in Egypt and to lead them back to the promised land. God said that he had witnessed the affliction of his people and heard their cries. God says he knows well the suffering of his people. And he says he has come down to rescue his people from the Egyptians, right? There'd be a few things we could do here covering the life of Moses. I would actually chiefly recommend after you read the scripture, if you want to watch the movie, uh, The Prince of Egypt, it covers these things quite well, quite effectively. And in fact, most of the events that we're about to, to read and discuss are covered there. I want to talk about signs and wonders. A sign is an object, action, event, pattern, etc., that conveys some meaning or represents something. So for example, a high temperature is a sign. It signifies a fever. It is significant. A red light at an intersection signifies or means is a sign that we should stop. Now, a wonder is a cause of astonishment or admiration or something with remarkable properties or abilities. Paris, the Eiffel Tower, the Louvre, it's a city of wonder and beauty. Now, Exodus chapter 7, verses 1 to 6, I'm about to read to you. Exodus chapter 7. And the Lord said to Moses, See, I make you as God to Pharaoh, and Aaron your brother shall be your prophet. You shall speak all that I command you. And Aaron, your brother, shall tell Pharaoh to let the sons of Israel go out of his land. But I will harden Pharaoh's heart. And though I multiply my signs and wonders in the land of Egypt, Pharaoh will not listen to you. Then I will lay my hand upon Egypt and bring forth my hosts, my people, the sons of Israel, out of the land of Egypt by great acts of judgment. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. When I stretch forth my hand upon Egypt and bring out the sons of Israel from among them. And Moses and Aaron did so. They did as the Lord commanded them. The events in the Exodus represent, and I hope you can tell in the charged language there, the events in the Exodus represent a conflict between God and the Pharaoh of Egypt, which God wins soundly at every score. Even though God had called Moses and his brother Aaron, and sent them to the Pharaoh to tell him to let the Israelites go free. The Pharaoh refused. He even mocked the God of the Israelites, saying, I do not know the Lord. The Egyptians were what we would call polytheistic. They believed in many theos, gods, poly, many, theon, god, polytheistic, many gods. They worshipped many gods. To the Egyptians, and probably many of the Israelites, since they had lived in Egypt for 400 years, the Lord God, Yahweh, was just one of many gods. The Egyptians even worshipped Pharaoh himself as a god. And so God needed to convince Pharaoh and the Egyptian people, and more importantly, the Israelites themselves, that he was the one true and only God. And to do this through Moses, he had to win some battles. God sent ten plagues upon Egypt. Each plague symbolized God's victory over or defeat of an Egyptian god, right? All these signs and wonders are a direct conflict of the God of Israel overcoming the supposed gods of Egypt. 
So for example, in the first plague, God turned the water of the Nile River to blood. The Egyptians depended upon the Nile for life. It provided water to drink and water for their crops. And in fact, the Egyptians worshiped a God they called Hapi, who was the embodiment of the Nile River. So by changing the Nile to blood, God showed that he was the true God, and the symbolism there is rich, that he slayed the river God, right? God showed that he was the true God and was more powerful than the false God, Hapi. Another example is the ninth plague, in which God sent a great darkness upon Egypt that blocked out the sun. The greatest of the Egyptian gods, you may know this, was Ra, the god of the sun. And so by blocking the sun and engulfing all of Egypt in darkness, God showed the people that he was more powerful than even the greatest of the Egyptian gods. So through the plagues, God worked many extraordinary signs and wonders so that the people of Egypt and the chosen people of Israel would know that he was God, right? There's a great couple of pages in your workbook that we don't have time to go through together. But if you wanted to work through this, just because it's so cool, actually, to see each of the 10 plagues and how they match up, you can work through these sheets 142, 143, and 144, the 10 plagues, okay? It's a really cool discussion, but we need to move on to Moses, but feel free to do that yourself. I really encourage it to, uh, to look at those plagues, okay? Now we are going to turn to page 145 together and complete page 145 on your own. Read these passages from Exodus 4, okay? So these are about Moses' signs, reading the passages from Exodus 4 to identify the three signs God gave Moses. The first sign in Exodus 4, verses 2 to 5, is that God turned Moses' staff into a serpent and back again. The sign in Exodus 4, verses 6 through 8, is that when Moses placed his hand in his cloak and removed it, it became leprous, like he had leprosy. But when he put it back in his cloak and removed it again, it was clean. And the final sign in Exodus 4, verse 9, when Moses would pour water from the Nile onto the ground, it would turn to blood. Now, over on the back side of this, there's a really beautiful correspondence between these three signs to Moses and things that God does in the New Testament. Right? It says here on part two, page 146, the signs and wonders worked by Moses prefigure the signs and wonders worked by Jesus. So it says, read the information and the three gospel passages describing Jesus and write down which scripture passage matches Jesus doing one of the three things that only God can do. So number four, only God has power over Satan. That's the passage from Mark 8. Number five, only God can forgive sins. That's the passage from Mark 16. And finally, that only God can give life. That's the passage from Luke 5. So there's this wonderful continuity between God having power over all the little gods, the, the powers and the principalities, the dark forces of the world. Only God has ultimate power of those that he shares with us through the church. And once you're done with that, I want to turn and look at Moses uh, in, in more detail. So one of the next pages in your workbook is page 147, and it has this work of art on it. It's called Moses smashing the tablets of the law. So this is the painting of Moses, who was the central figure of the Exodus, and one of the most important people in the Old Testament and the entire Bible. Tradition has long held that Moses, in fact, was the author of the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And so those were known as the Pentateuch, the Pentateuch, the five books or the books of Moses. So sometimes you might have an older school version of Genesis that says uh, the first book of Moses, Genesis, right? Let's look at this painting together. What's Moses doing here? Well, he's holding the stone tablets of the Ten Commandments, and he's about to smash them. Since after coming down from the mountain, he found the Israelites worshiping the golden calf. And what are some of the things you know about Moses? You might know, and if you did some of the work or you watched the Prince of Egypt, right, you know that Moses was placed in a basket as a baby and hidden in the Nile River where he was raised by Pharaoh's daughter. You might know that he killed an Egyptian soldier, that God appeared to him in a burning bush. We're about to hear about that. That he told Pharaoh to let his people go, that he parted the Red Sea, 
that he sent 10 plagues upon Egypt. He received the 10 commandments. He led the Israelites through the desert, the promised land. He died before entering the promised land and so forth, right? Moses influenced much of the Bible. The Ten Commandments was the law the Hebrew people followed even in Jesus's time. There are a couple instances of a rich man approaching Jesus and saying, Lord, I have kept the commandments all my life. What must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus checks with the guy, have you, have, you, know, have you murdered? Have you stolen? Have you whatever? And then Jesus says to the guy, um, okay, fine, uh, sell all your possessions and give the money to the poor and then come and follow me in order to follow those first three commandments, right? To honor God, the Lord your God, the Lord alone, to keep holy the Sabbath, to have no other gods but me, right? So those, the Ten Commandments are major for the Israelites. Jesus talks about them all the time, in fact. Jesus taught that not, not one small piece of the law would pass away until the end of time. The whole law is important. And that means we are still bound to follow the Ten Commandments, which form the foundation of the Christian moral life. The Exodus itself, Moses leading the Israelites out of slavery in Egypt into new life in the promised land. That foreshadows the new exodus that Christ would lead, leading the human race out of slavery from sin into new life in the kingdom of God. We can learn a lot about God's plan for us. So if you're ever wondering what God wants you to do in any given instance, return to the scriptures, return to the, the Old Testament, right? First basic question, am I keeping the commandments? Like, that's the first thing you can check to see. Like, am I following God's will for you, for, for me? Like, God, what do you want me to do? Well, check the commandments, right? Have you done those things? That's why we do this examination of conscience constantly, and especially why we do it before we come to the sacrament of reconciliation, right? That's God's will for you to follow the commandments. He's really clear about that, right? We can learn a lot about God's plan for us by better understanding Moses' life and what he accomplished. And we have to skip a little bit of Moses' birth story and, the, and uh, Jesus' escape to Egypt. It's lovely. Feel free to read those things if you like on pages 148 and 150. But I want to jump ahead to this episode of the burning bush, right? I'll, I'll read a little bit about Moses, but then we're going to jump to the burning bush. Moses, who grew up in luxury as a member of fam Pharaoh's family, had to flee Egypt for the desert land of Midian. Moses witnessed an Egyptian soldier mistreating an Israelite slave, and he lashed out in anger and killed the soldier. Moses was wanted for murder, and so he ran. In Midian, he became a shepherd of the flocks of Reuel, the priest of Midian, and eventually he married Reuel's daughter, Zipporah. Forty years passed since Moses left Egypt, and he's now 80 years of age and still a shepherd. One day, while Moses was out with his sheep, he's 80. God called him and gave him a new ish mission. God is always calling people at the end of their life and giving them a new mission. This is true with Abraham. So it happens with Moses at age 80, right? Let's read Exodus 3, verses 1 to 10. So this is before the plagues, actually. <clears throat> so, now Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian, and he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burnt. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, here am I. Then he said, do not come near. Put off your shoes from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hevites, and the Jebusites. And now behold, the cry of the sons of Israel has come to me, and I have seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppress them. Come, I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring forth my people, the sons of Israel, out of Egypt. 
So here, God identified himself to Moses as, quote, the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob for a specific reason. Why? Because there were a lot of gods around. The Egyptians and likely many of the Israelites were polytheistic. Ra, Hapi, Anubis, right? All of these figures. Osiris. That means they worshiped more than one God. So by telling Moses who he was in this way, God was making the point that he is not just another God among many gods. Rather, he is the God of Moses' people, the Israelites, and he's come to free them from slavery. God gives Moses the task of leading his people to freedom. Moses, however, does not say yes to God's plan immediately. Now, I want you to turn in your workbooks to pages 155, page 155, and we're going to read about God's name, how this story continues, God's name. So make sure you read all of 155 over onto 156. We're going to complete this chart together, this chart on 156, and that's the last thing we'll do today. Right. <clears throat> so number one. On, under the meaning of a name. What does a person's name express, right? A name expresses a person's essence, his or her deep identity. Now, what does God's name, I am, mean? It means that his existence and constant presence to his people, Israel. He was in the beginning. He is with them now in their suffering. And he will be when all is finished, right? I am. Tell them I am sent you. Number two, what does it mean to have a name? To have a name, right, is to not be a number, but to know that you are someone, not something, that you are a person and not an object, that you are knowable, that you are not anonymous without a name, anonymous, right? What is the fact that God has a name reveal about him? It means that he's knowable. He's not just an anonymous force, like, a, like the force, or like some nameless spirit. God is able to be addressed personally and known more intimately. Number three, what is the meaning of telling someone your name? It makes you known to others. It's an invitation to be known, right? Now, how did God reveal himself to his people Israel? What did this revelation mean for man's relationship with God? God revealed his name to Moses in the burning bush and thus to everyone. This revelation was an invitation to know him intimately. And we'll pick up this thread with the next lesson when we talk about Passover and parting of the Red Sea and the giving of the Ten Commandments. For now, let's close in gratitude with an Our Father. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Take care, and God bless.